Next on KCTS 9 Connects, the primary election is less than a week away, and we have just one question for you. Are you voting? The shortage of sensational races has some people calling this a sleeper primary. But the races in next week's election could have a major impact on the balance of power, not just here in the state, but in Washington, D.C., too. Coming up, which block of voters could have the most impact in the primary? Plus, our panel of political insiders will break down the major races, who's safe and who's in trouble for next week's vote. Local production and broadcast of KCTS 9 Connects with Enrique Serna is made possible in part by a major grant from the Floyd and Dolores Jones Foundation and by KCTS 9 members. Become a member today by going to kcts9.org. Thank you. Welcome to KCTS 9 Connects, taking you beyond the headlines of Northwest news, issues, and politics. Tonight, a special primary preview from the heated Senate race for Patty Murray's seat to state legislative races that could tip the balance of power in Olympia. We're going to bring you in-depth analysis of the major races on next week's ballot. Joining me now is the special insiders roundtable, political strategist Kathy Allen, Seattle Times editorial columnist Joni Balter, political strategist Todd Myers, and SeattlePI.com correspondent Chris Griegel. Thank you all for being here. We're going to get to all of you in just a moment and all of your perspectives on everything. But first, a simple question. All right, here's the deal. Have you filled this thing out yet? Are you going to vote? Now, voter turnout isn't expected to be very high for the primary, mostly because of bad timing. In the past, the primary has been in September, but now it's a month earlier in August to give candidates more time to communicate their message to voters during the fall for the general election. But critics worry voters are so distracted with summer, they're forgetting the primary. Leslie McClurg hit the streets to find out who's paying attention and which voters will likely control the election. From the top of Queen Anne Hill to Alki Beach, we talked to younger voters. It seemed they were more interested in playing volleyball than hardball politics. So you knew that the primary is coming up? Um, actually, I did not know. No, I think I've just been swept up in summer and other things and not paying attention. Secretary of State Sam Reed predicts what he calls a reasonable turnout. Reasonable being 38%. Political consultant Allison Peters says that's about par for the course. Who I worry about are young voters. Uh, I don't know, I just haven't really been paying attention. So. I'm not really um, into it. I don't really know much about it. It's just all com too confusing. Two years ago, you know, during the presidential election, you know, we had this surge of young voters become pretty passionate and interested in the elections. Was that just an anomaly? It usually takes a really hot mayor's race or a congressional race for those young voters to feel like something needs to be done, something needs to happen. Peters also says it takes strong grassroots organizing and aggressive social media campaigning to reach younger voters. But there's another surprising group that's even more difficult to motivate. The biggest group of voters that don't turn out are unmarried women. I am embarrassed to say that I wasn't even aware of the elections. It's not been a priority for me just because everything seems to be fine the way it is for me in my world at this point. <laughs> So who will be a factor in this year's primary? The average age of a consistent voter is over 55. I vote every time. If we're not voting, uh, we can't complain about what we get. Well, the Seattle Times this week had the article saying that the older vote is going to actually swing or make the difference. They tend to be more active on a whole range of issues. So I think that's one of the reasons that they could make or break the difference this year. Do you see any trends in Washington state moving us further right, moving us further left as we move into this election cycle? What I'm hearing from voters when I talk to them in focus groups, when I talk to people on the street, is that voters think we need all types of, of leaders in the legislature. But most of the voters we talk to still hold party line preferences. So I'm voting straight Democratic, as liberal as possible. And right now the Democrats are controlling, they're doing a lot of things wrong, and so that brings a lot of support towards our side. We'll see. I guess we won't know until November. What I would be really thrilled about is to see 
greater participation from, from younger people each and every election, but especially in primaries. All right, let's kick things off now with our round table. Uh, first, let's uh, weigh in on that voter turnout number. Sam Reed has said 38%. Uh, Do some of you feel that it's actually going to be higher? I think so. I think that King County elections, uh, Cheryl Huff has already said she thinks it's going to be 43%. And already early returns show a heavier turnout. So I think that what we're seeing right now is people actually getting the ballots in. All right. Others? Well, I guess I think that um, the, close, the, the race is going to be kind of they're going to be really tight this time. I, I don't know, but the turnout does not seem like it's going to include many of the younger voters. So if you if you buy that piece, and I keep thinking about, you know, Obama tied, yeah. where it's not going to be there. So some of these uh, maybe legislative candidates who came in uh, in, in the tide are probably not going to do that well. So. What, you, what you see a lot of times with, especially with now that we have the mail in is that the motivated voters turn in their ballots early and then you see a big fall off and then maybe the final weekend. We've seen a lot more motivated voters because ballots are coming in at a higher number earlier, but I don't think that that necessarily is indicative of what we'll see this weekend and we may see a, a smaller vote this weekend with sort of the independent voters. I think what's also depressing turnout is that a lot of the big campaigns are just you know keeping their powder dry. It's, this has been a relatively quiet primary season and and I, I don't think that uh, you know the energy or turnout in the primary will be necessarily indicative of what's going to happen in the fall. Very quickly, Kathy, what's up with the unmarried women? Why don't <laughs> they turn out? You know, unmarried women tend to look at this and they see if they don't see a lot of really great people on the ballot, they say, ah, I'm not going to vote. I got better things to do in terms of just trying to enjoy the summer. And frankly, what's happened is that these women have yet to see people who have motivated them to be able to vote for or against them. This primary is a quieter kind of time. I'm going to be surprised if uh, if there are a lot of hot races that really are settled next Tuesday. I think everything is leading up for this tide that's coming in November. Yeah, it's going to hit us all of a sudden. Uh, let's take a look now at the uh, Senate race, uh, U.S. Senate race. Who's going to be running against uh, Patty Murray? Uh, right now on the Republican side, uh, she's facing a challenge from Paul Akers, also Clint Didier, and of course Dino Rossi. And uh, let's also look at some of the uh, the way the polls have showed, because uh, it's broken down on, on all of these folks running against her. Uh, and we look at uh, Patty Murray versus uh, Paul Akers in the Rasmussen poll. It shows 48-42 uh, uh, for Murray in the Elway poll. We're at 47-33. Washington poll, 45-44. Now, if you turn to Patty Murray versus Clint Didier in the Rasmussen poll, uh, she has a lead of 48-45. Elway has her out there in front, 46 to 32. And, of course, Dino Rossi. That's the big one here that everybody's looking at. Uh, in the polling for Rasmussen, it's tight. 49% for Murray, 47% for Rossi. Elway has her out there a bit more of a lead, 47% to 40%. And the Washington poll has it tied at 42 to 40%. Uh, interesting that I noticed today the Washington Post uh, uh, has, uh, instead of it leaning Democratic, it says that uh, in this state, in the Senate race, it's a toss-up now. Um, I, I guess we're all looking at, at, pa at Patty Murray versus Dino Rossi at this point in mm -hmm. uh, a tight race. And yes, and this race has been tightening, and that is the reason for the Washington Post decision. Uh, you've had the, um, the Cook political report has been moving this race. This race is close. It's closer than people think, but I don't know that you can tell from Tuesday's numbers what would actually happen in November. Because Rossi, who will definitely emerge as her challenger, has to beat down these other two folks. What's happened that's interesting is because of the noise that the Didier campaign and Sarah Palin's endorsement of uh, Didier has meant is that uh, I think Dino has been pushed more to the right. And what we're seeing, he had got a very bad time in Spokane. I had it, I read about it. Also the fact that uh, Franklin County and Chelan County, they're both giving him a bad time. That Tea Party movement is really actually making a play to actually kind of divide a portion of what I would say the old right guard of the Republican Party. Meanwhile, we Democrats just sitting there going, hey, you know, we got some action over here. Come see us. Come see us. Todd Myers, well, what do you I say? I actually think that that story about Spokane is, is good for Dino because what it shows is, is that he hasn't moved to the right. That okay, he, break that down. What happened in Spokane? So he, well, the Spokane, he met with the Spokane party, and the Spokane party is one of the most conservative, and I think there's also a lot of folks from the Ron Paul camp, um, and they, he wasn't sort of, you know, far right libertarian enough for them, and they, uh, you know, chewed on him a little bit about it. Well, I think that's great for Dino because what that says is, is that he is not 
you know, being pushed by the Tea Party. He is a fiscal conservative. And frankly, this year, there is one issue on the voters' minds, and that is the economy and the deficit. And as a fiscal conservative who is not extreme, that positions Dino perfectly. I don't think that's, a, that's not one subject. That's two subjects, the economy and, uh, uh, I, and the, the, the deficit. See, I don't the think it's the deficit. The, all together. The I don't think so. It all I don't together. think people care about the deficit. I think that what they see is they think that the economy is a valid uh, uh, comment, particularly here in Washington State, where the governor turned around and Chris, decided it was a bad I, thing. I think people are going to be looking at the numbers on Tuesday. If Patty Murray's below 40%, that's very bad for her. But people are also going to look at, be looking at Clint Didier's numbers. If he's at 10% or above, that's a, that's a sign of a, a restless a Republican right-wing base. What and the question is, what does Rossi do to get those people back? What the Democrats have to worry about is the enthusiasm gap. Their voters are not motivated. They're not fired up. They're sort of like, you know, what did we get when we, when we bought this group? So that's and, one and, of the problems. And what's up there? I mean, why? Well, I don't know, but the whole thing turned. I mean, you know, people were so wildly, they thought Obama was going to solve everything. And then after just a very short period of time when he didn't solve everything, and boom, he, it he just go. And he said he would solve everything. He said that if they passed the stimulus package, unemployment wouldn't get above 7%. Well, we're now at 9.5 percent, and we're talking well, about guys, going back up. Well, guys, I hate up. to say this, and but And so it's those a... promises weren't kept, and so the voters oh. are unhappy about like that. Is That's the why the Democrats. Like, fault because the economy he, is in the crap? He I don't made think the, so. He made the promise, and so now they're saying, you made the promise, you didn't keep your promise, and so what that has done is fired up Republicans. Those folks are not going to vote for Patty Murray. They're still fired up. They want a change in direction. They're going to support okay. Rossi. Dino Rossi's taking an interesting tactic in Washington state, he's arguing against federal largesse and stimulus funding. And Washington state was built on federal money. And, and Patty Murray is basically saying, you bet I'm a pork barreler. I'm, I bring money back to the state. And with Boeing and with other industries benefiting from the federal government, I, I think it'll be very interesting to see uh, you know, whether Rossi can make that anti-federal stimulus, federal funding and argument stick here in Washington state. I read state. a quote on Politico where uh, uh, a strategist uh, nationally saying that, you know, it used to be that, you know, bringing home the bacon was a good thing, but maybe not so much anymore. Well, Washington, for every dollar we send to Washington, D.C., we get 80 cents back. So I understand that she's running on pork barrel, and it's the same campaign, frankly, that she ran in 1998, but it's 2010. It's not 1998, and I think that okay, the mood me, has changed. Let me bring up one thing here before we move on, and that is Dino Rossi really kind of moving to the right because he's probably pushed there. Could that come back and bite him? Of course it is going to come back to bite him, but actually I thought, I have to tell you that the one thing that made me laugh when I was listening to the, everyone giving him a bad time in Spokane was he was doing really a, a vintage Dino Rossi operation. They would ask him about these really tough right-wing positions, and as opposed to moving further to the right, what he would do is not answer the question. All right. What do you think? Well, there was, a, there was a perfect moment in that where somebody said, made some nasty comment about Maria Cantwell and Patty Murray, and Dino Rossi said, It was a horrible I, comment. I don't think you meant that. And so what that says is he is not going to be pushed by sort of populism and the, the, the mood uh, away from where he is and the kind of candidate he is. And he stood up to those folks and said, no, that's not where we are. And, and he's going to do that. And that's why he hasn't been moved to the All right. right. Well, let's leave it there because we're going to go to the congressional races next. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look now at the congressional districts. All nine representatives are up for re-election. Most of the incumbents are pretty safe, but two districts are in play. The third congressional district, where Brian Baird is stepping down, and the eighth district, where Dave Reichert is facing a strong challenge. Let's start first with the uh, third district. Uh, a lot of people running for there, but the uh, names to watch, Denny Heck, a Democrat. Uh, on the Republican side, two people to watch, Jamie Herrera, and David Castillo. Let's talk about the Republicans uh, because they have two pretty good candidates there. Uh, we endorsed, the uh, at the Times, we endorsed David Castillo and it had very much, and we also endorsed Denny Heck, it was a dual endorsement. But we picked Castillo because he had a more coherent answer about the war in Afghanistan. I felt like Jamie Herrera was sort of dancing around that and kind of wanted her to be more specific about what victory looked like and she didn't. What's that. it looking from the Republican side there? My uh, expectation is is that Jamie will come out of that. She yeah. obviously has been elected. Um, she's a very, uh, I think, a strong candidate in a lot of ways. Very charismatic. Comes, you know, has a Latino community support. Um, so I think she has a lot of uh, attractive features. But David Castillo, I think he really has, frankly, come out of nowhere. He had good credentials, but I don't think anybody expected him to be as strong as he is. And even if he loses this race, he really has a great future and has. It's hard to create a future by losing, but I think 
even if he loses, he really has. What's his background? What's his background? He worked for the federal government yep, and, yes. and has good political experience, and so and that's one of the things that he's campaigning on. Is says, you know, I've I've done it. I've done the hard work of, of do, making these decisions. I think he's got a lot of the early insider endorsements. The attorney general, I think, has endorsed him. I think the one thing about Jamie is she's exciting. She, this is going to be a year when you, to look different and to be more different is going to actually make a difference. And I think in this case, you know, depending on what happens in the in the primary, I got to tell you that I think that both of them are going to have a run for their lives because I think Denny Heck is going to take the cake in this one. Back to Jimmy Herrera, but makes, what makes her stand out in all of this? I, I think, uh, you know, what Kathy was saying, it's just a, a fresh face. In, in, in Young, woman, Hispanic. Time when people are looking for, for people who look a little bit uh, like they could bring change that people are clamoring for. I think the third district is just a great race. It's always, because it's such a swing district, I mean, you look at the history of it, it has gone back and forth. So. And Denny Heck. Uh, he's uh, he's an old hand, really. Yeah, I I, I like Denny. He's a he's yeah. a friend of mine. Maybe that maybe that's cursing him. But anyway, um, <laughs> but you know he, his his campaign actually he's running against Congress. His his yard signs even say "Give Congress heck." Um, oh, so he's so he's that. actually running to say we need change, which I think is difficult for a Democrat. But that's the dis that's the route he's decided works best for him in that district. Mm -hmm. and, and, but what's going to that's a conservative district, really. It's kind of an interesting no, district. It's a it's a it's a it's a working class. It's yeah, a swing with right. very high unemployment. They have something it does. like thirteen percent right. unemployment. A lot of okay. in migration in terms of folks from uh, Oregon that actually live in Vancouver area. The fact is is that it's uh, got Cowlitz County which is kind of a working class one, then it's got Lewis County, which is really conservative, and that's got Olympia, which That's, is really liberal. But yeah. you look at the state level, and that district votes Republican for statewide candidates, but it will choose Democrats and other, uh, yeah. and those sorts of candidates. All right, let's move level. over to the 8th Congressional District, which is always, uh, mm -hmm. since Dave Reichert has been there, been a very interesting district. Uh, laundry list of folks running there. Of course, Dave Reichert is the incumbent. Uh, Susan uh, Delbany is uh, running against him, former Microsoft person, uh, raised quite a bit of money, a lot of it her own. Uh, the Times, uh, as we mentioned last week, has endorsed Tim Dillon over Dave Reichert. But does that make any difference? I, I, well, I, I think well, of course it does make I, a difference. <laughs> it's quite a profound statement when, a, you know, when the leading newspaper doesn't endorse the incumbent at all, even just for the primary. That's a big deal. Yeah, but does it make it a difference in the vote? She says I'm humbly. But yeah. So humbly. I think it does. <laughs> but I think that what happens is it's part of a record of uh, just seeing a lot of missteps by the Reichert campaign. What, what, what Del Benny is doing is, is she's, she's run a strong campaign. She's a strong candidate. She is sort of the anti-Darcy Burner. Darcy Burner tried to run for, you know, the, the Seattle Congressional District race. She was always trying to appeal to the stranger, to people in Seattle. Del Benny spent her time in the 8th District going out, talking to people. She hasn't spent a lot of money yet, but she's really positioned herself extremely well. And things like the Times non-endorsement of Reichert only help her. I think this is a, a very competitive race. I think Reichert's in a lot of trouble. Here's the problem is, is that the 8th Congressional District is neither fish nor fowl, and Dave Reichert... Or Reicher, nor are. And, and Dave Reichert has tried to fit that district. He is conservative, yeah. but on environmental issues, he's a big supporter of the Alpine Lakes Wilderness Area and other things like that. And so what you said well, about... Except the, for the unfortunate what, what comment said, about his environmental ethics are tied to trying to stay elected. But no, that's, but but that's not true, but he, he led that, but yeah. And he led the fight for the Alpine Lakes Wilderness and got it. And so the problem is, is that when you have a candidate who try, who is neither fish nor fowl, what people say about him reflects, I think, more what the people believe. If you think that sort of him making these all decisions, if you're cynical, you say, oh, that's cynical politics. If you're a moderate, you say, he's a moderate. And so a lot of the criticism, I think, of Dave Reichert reflects more on the people who are criticizing them, him. He's trying to fit the district. It's a very tough thing to do, but I think he's done about as well as anybody can well, do. Well, and actually, this is the year of change, right? And so it swings both ways. If you happen to be an incumbent, a many-termed incumbent, what happens is that that change is working against you, too, particularly when she's got very, very deep pockets. And so there's money there as well as... And this is a contested race that I was surprised was even in the toss-up range, but it really is also now one of the toss-up in the country. All right, let's uh, move on here. Up next, the legislative races. There are some tight races in a few key legislative districts, and the outcome could change the balance of power in Olympia. Let's take a look at some of the races and how they could uh, shape up in the 41st Legislative District and State Senate. We have Steve Litzow and Randy Gordon. Uh, for State Representative in that District 41, 
Marcy Maxwell and Pete Dunbar will be likely facing off. Legislative District 47 State Senate, Joe Thane and Claudia Kaufman. And uh, that could be a tough race for Claudia Kaufman. Over uh, for representative in the 47th District, uh, Nancy Wyatt, Jeff Simpson, Mark Hargrove. We'll see what happens there as far as who are going to be the uh, top two candidates. Legislative District 48 and the Senate side, Rodney Tom, Greg Bennett, Ronald Full. Legislative District for State Representative. This could be interesting. Diane Tabelius, a uh, former party chair here in the state for the Republicans, and Ross Hunter, who's been in the legislature for quite some time now. So what are we looking at as far as uh, some close races here? Let, let's go to this race regarding uh, uh, Claudia Kaufman in the state Senate. Now, is she facing a big challenge? Yeah, she is. This is ground zero. In my opinion, all of these races that really ended up giving us a Democratic edge in the, in the presidential year, I got to tell you that what we're seeing right now is with a perspective of, you know, the economy and people feeling angsty about everything. What happened is that this is ground zero. I think that all those three districts you mentioned are truly going to be the core. Claudia Kaufman, this is a great state senator, not only a woman, but the only um, uh, Native American woman in the Senate in America. In all of this, this is a pretty hot person. In terms of all this, Joe Fain running a very good campaign. And the interesting thing, this is a muckleshoot territory. The interesting thing about this is it is a swing conservative area, and that's the problem. Okay. A lot of this is the referendum on how the legislature performed when it was so democratic. You had the liberals really directing traffic and really deciding what would happen and sort of stranding some of these moderate Democrats and, and even moderate Republicans in certain ways. Uh, I did some doorbelling with the two candidates in the 48th legislative district Diane this week. Diane and, and Ross Hunter. I was out with both of them. Very interesting. I mean, instead of finding that big anger pool out there, what I was so struck by was how thoughtful and measured people were. You had Democrats voting for Republicans, Republicans voting for Democrats. These are close races. And the, and the problem in the 47th is, is that it is a swing district, and neither Claudia Kaufman nor Jeff Simpson are particularly moderate. I mean, they're both pretty liberal, and so that's a real challenge for them. Uh, Nancy Wyatt, who's running against Jeff Simpson, uh, ran the Chamber of Commerce. It's one of those people that when you meet her, she just is very friendly. You just want to like her. Um, and so when she comes to your doorstep and talks to you, she's very sharp and very likable. I think that's the real benefit. The Republicans, Republicans have had a hard time, frankly, in getting good candidates in all of these districts that we could have had chances in the past. We don't have that problem this year. We have Bal good candidates. Balance of power? Well, I actually think the district I'm going to be looking at is 48th. Yeah, yeah. Tom and 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 Hunter Rodney face Tom, right? very strong Rodney Tom. candidates, mm -hmm. yeah. and and it, there's a lot of money behind these races. Former and Republican, in, yes, uh, right, yes, the Democrat. switch to sort of yeah. match the, the shift if, if in the district. If the Republicans are going to come back, they're going to come back. He was a Republican like before he was Rodney Tom was a Republican before he was a Democrat and wrote the budget before he voted against it. So that's his <laughs> challenge. <laughs> okay, you know. I want to make sure we talk about the state Supreme Court positions. Uh, uh, Jim Johnson, who uh, has been on the court, uh, well, he's very conservative, but he's facing a challenge from Stan Rumbaugh. Um, and what are we looking at there? Also, or the other position is uh, position six, and Richard Sanders has been the incumbent there, has always been kind of an interesting character. But back to Johnson and Rumbaugh, what, what are we looking at there? Well, for the most interesting thing is that these are races that are going to be settled on Tuesday, I believe, that we'll find that we will have winners and losers on Tuesday. Even though their names go on to the general, their opponents do not. So I think that we see end there. What happens is that the, the most interesting thing to me is, remember, it was just uh, in the last Supreme Court races, we had $866,000 spent on independent expenditures, and another group of people came in to fight the independent expenditure. This year, we have about a quarter million of money coming from special interest groups to try to influence the race, and, and this time and they're And Jim Johnson specifically is being yes. really targeted here. Yeah, by the, SE, by the SEIU. And what's so interesting is, is that when you get political geeks like us together and you say <laughs> what's important, <laughs> oh, speak and, for yourself. And, we, and we talk about, well, the Senate, you know, yeah. Elena Kagan is very important, and here the state's, you know, Supreme Court is important. Uh, or I should say the Supreme Court, I think I said Senate, but anyway, that these judiciary races are important, but most people don't pay attention to them. They're over in the primary, yeah. and so it's an opportunity for special interests to move in, target important races yeah. without stirring up a lot of dust um, and getting their people out, and they can make a real difference. Final no word. kidding. Final word. W w what's crazy about the Supreme Court races is that most people don't pay attention to them. We were joking before, if you have a bland-sounding name like Johnson or Sanders, you get elected.
But you know, it's it's amazing. You should to run me. with your last name. It's How do you even pronounce me. it? I've How never much won. money I've never is spent on these races? Well, you know? and it's because they're important. And like I say, people who pay attention to this understand how important the Supreme Court at all levels yeah. is. But I think the general public, I mean, there's so many issues that it's very hard for them to sort out. They don't feel like they're qualified to make judgments on these races. And so what ends up is special interests have an inordinate impact in these races. Yeah, okay, we, we must leave it there because I have to fill out my ballot. All, Thank right? You. all right? Thank you all. We'll help you. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm help sure you, you will. <laughs> Thank you for your time. Uh, have a good weekend. You too. Mm -hmm. All right. Next time on Connect, food safety. Some meat folks call, you know, Jack in the Box, they're 9-11. It was one of the worst food poisoning outbreaks in U.S. history. Five people died, hundreds seriously ill after eating tainted fast food burgers. But nearly 20 years after the so-called Jack in the Box E. coli outbreak, how safe is your food now? Next week, a closer look at what still is putting your food at risk. And that's all for this edition of KCTS 9 Connects. You can stay connected to us anytime. Visit our website at kcts9.org. Follow updates about news and programming on Twitter or become a fan of our page on Facebook. I'm Enrique Cerna. We'll see you next time. Local production and broadcast of KCTS 9 Connects with Enrique Cerna is made possible in part by a major grant from the Floyd and Dolores Jones Foundation and by KCTS 9 members. Become a member today by going to kcts9.org. Thank you.